I'm okay with that. I like those prayers. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is, this for this position, and I didn't even know it at the time, they were negotiating at work over uh, shift differentials, and it's a night shift position. And if I go to night shift, I get a shift diff. Guess how much it is? Two dollars and fifty cents. That's before I get a raise. Right. You know, so Amen. I'm expecting to be blessed for what we pray for and then some. Right. Amen. Because that's what he does. Amen. Amen. That's right. <laughs> Somebody else. Once, twice, three times. <laughs> Uh, we've been in this series and we've been we've been looking through Romans uh, basically most of the time going verse by verse. We've gotten through the first five chapters of Romans, so we're looking in Romans chapter 6 tonight. And we're going to skip in and around about the first 14 verses or so in Romans chapter 6. Um, but Chuck Swindoll, if, if any of you ever read any of Chuck Swindoll, he was, he's from days gone by, but Chuck Swindoll was this great Christian pastor and teacher and wrote lots of great books. And he wrote this book called... The Seasons of Life. And he wrote about, you may ever read the, the comic B.C., The Caveman? So he, he was writing about this, The Caveman B.C. in the comics. And he said that the caveman B.C. leaned on a boulder and the rock was inscribed, <coughs> Trivia Test. And so B.C. is administering this exam or this test to one of his prehistoric buddies in the comic strip. And he said, here's one from the Bible. What were the last words uttered by Lot's wife? And without a moment's hesitation, his skin-clad friend next to him in the comics said, Ah, but heck, with your fanatical beliefs, I'm going to take one last look. And Swindoll wrote, She might not have said those exact words, but that's what Lot's wife was thinking, or worse. And we know, if we've read the Scriptures, we know what happened to Mrs. Lot. When she takes that one last look back in Genesis chapter 19, she becomes a pillar of salt. And the Bible tells us that she was no more in the flesh. And Chuck Swindoll, kind of, he, he was one of those people who would tell you a story to tell you a story. And he said the purpose, the reason that he said that, he said the bottom line of Mrs. Lot's philosophy could have been etched on her salt block gravestone. There's no need to take God seriously. And Chuck Swindoll said, I know of no philosophy that's, no more, that's more popular in today's world than those words. And man, that's true. There's no philosophy that's any more popular in the world out there around us than this idea that I don't have to take God seriously. Yeah, God's Word says this, and yeah, I know you believe that, but I don't really have to take God seriously. Can I tell you tonight that we all need to take God seriously? Yes. And then even more than that, we need to take His Word seriously. Because yes. I know that there are so many people, and there are people in the world, but there are, there are professing Christians tonight who refuse to listen to the Word of God, who refuse to obey His commands. It's just like, it's like water off of a duck's back with some of those people. When it comes to sin, we need to take God seriously. Because sin is what for all of eternity has separated us from God. And we've just we've talked and we've sang and we've testified about the blood of Jesus which came to give us a way to not be separated from God anymore. And we need to be thankful for that blood. But we also need to take sin seriously and realize that it separates us from God. And for some people, it's going to separate them from God for eternity because they didn't take it seriously. Because there are people around us who would prefer, they would rather enjoy the pleasures of life as they might be. They, might, they would rather enjoy the pleasures of sin than take God and His Word seriously. They know better, but they don't want to do better. They don't want to repent and they don't want to seek the Lord. And so in our text that we're looking at in Romans, in Romans chapter 6, in, and we're going to read it in a few moments, but in that first verse in Romans chapter 6, Paul just asks this question. And the question is, shall we go on sinning? In other words, what Paul is basically saying when he says, shall we go on sinning is, now that we're in Christ, now that we're a believer, now that we've taken on the name of Jesus, shall we go on sinning? And I think that Paul gives us really three different answers. It's always no, but it gives us three different reasons that no, we shouldn't go on sinning. So three different ways that Paul answers this question. Should we go on sinning after we take on the name of Christ? First of all, no, we don't keep on sinning because we have died to sin. Look at what Paul says here in the first few verses. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. 
How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I was reading earlier this week about this man, and you guys know that diet fads come and go like nobody's business. Like you can, I mean, every time you, you go to Barnes & Noble and go to the section, look at how many different diet plans people take. It's the best ever. It's going to make you lose weight. So this guy's reading about a diet plan that's the eat-all-you-want diet. And he looks at his friend and he says, you know, I knew that there would be a catch to this thing. You've got to run 700 miles a day to eat everything I want to eat. <laughs> and you know, that's kind of like people are with sin. Eat all you want. Do all you want. You can do anything you want to. Yes, you have the free will to do it, but there is a catch to it. You can't outrun sin. You can't outdistance yourself from your sins. You can't escape your sins except through Jesus. He is the only way of escape from the power of sin. And Romans 6.23, on down in this chapter, tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So our only hope, our only escape from sin is found in Jesus. But I run into people all the time that say, man, I have this dilemma. Ever since I, I trusted in Jesus, ever since I surrendered to Him, ever since I, I started trying to walk in obedience to Him, I have, I have discovered that I still sin. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, if conversion to Christianity makes no improvement in a man's outward actions, if he continues to be just as snobbish or spiteful or envious or ambitious as he was before, then I think we must suspect that his conversion was largely imaginary. Hmm. I saw somewhere on Facebook where somebody had posted that particular quote, because C.S. Lewis gets, gets quoted a lot, and I was reading through the comments, which is like the worst thing you could ever do on Facebook, but I was reading through the comments, and one person said, kill the old man. And I thought, yeah, that person's right. And a lot of people had commented and didn't understand what that person was saying, but there comes a point in our Christian life where that old man needs to die. There was, this, there was this African convert to Christianity out in the, in the mission fields of Africa, this man who had found Jesus. And he was talking to this missionary who had, who had showed him the Lord, and he was, he was explaining all of what he was going through to this guy. And then he stole something. And the missionary went to this tribal man, and he said, Dude, why did you steal that? And the native replied, he said, It wasn't I who stole. It was the grandfather in the bones. And that, was that, and that was that tribal man's way of saying it was his old sinful nature. But thanks to God, through time, that tribal man grew stronger and stronger and stronger in his relationship with God. And later on when that missionary and some of the other missionaries would ask him how the grandfather in his bones would do in talking about the old man, he would say, well, grandfather isn't dead yet, but he doesn't get around like he used to. And I hope tonight that that's true for you as well, Because as we yield to Jesus, as we walk more closely with Him on a daily basis, that grandfather in the bones or, the, or that old man, the old nature of sin, will get weaker and weaker and we will do better and better in our Christian walk for Christ. There's an old story that says that, that winter was coming on and this hunter goes out in the forest and he decides he wants to shoot a bear. And so he, he had planned that he was going to make himself and his wife these nice coats out of the bear skin. And so he saw this big bear coming toward him, and he raised up his gun. But the bear said, wait, why do you want to shoot me? Because I'm cold, said the hunter, and I need a coat, but I'm hungry, the bear replied. So maybe if we just talk this over a little bit, then we can come to the compromise. So the hunter sat down beside the bear, and they started to talk over the pros and the cons, and in the end, the hunter got warm as the bear wrapped around him. Then you know what the bear did? He lulled the hunter to sleep, then he slit his throat, and he ate him. And that took a dark turn, I know. But the point is, we've got to say no to sin. We can't compromise with sin. Because when we compromise with sin, and we take one step, it takes three. And before you know it, one sin leads to three, leads to five, and we are enveloped in the old nature before we know it. We've got to develop the ability to say no to sin. Look back at verse 4. Paul says, We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You see, whether or not we realize it, when we, when we, when we, we died in baptism, because in baptism, it's symbolic of our death to our old nature, of our surrender of the old self. Baptism is when we acknowledge publicly what we've already done, that we said yes to Jesus and we're going to obey Him in repentance and baptism and we're going to die to sin. And sometimes we need to, we say all the time to married people that they need to remember the vows that we made. Sometimes as Christians, we need to remember the promise that we made. We need to remember the vows that we took in our relationship with Christ. When we took on that name, when we professed to be a Christian, when we went step forward in faith and in baptism, we need to remember what that meant and what we're trying to live up to. Billy Sunday, who I teach about sometimes in my, in my history classes, was this, this really famous um, evangelist. He had been a baseball player. Uh, but this really famous evangelist and, and Christian leader throughout the 20s and 30s. And I think he kind of had the right idea. He preached a really simple message. But his answer was always Jesus. He, he preached that Jesus and His blood was the answer to all of the problems of life. And in 1935, Billy Sunday had this quote. He said, I'm against sin. He said, I'll kick it as long as I've got a foot. And I'll fight it as long as I've got a fist. And I'll butt it as long as I've got a head. And I'll bite it as long as I've got a tooth. And when I'm old and fistless and footless and toothless, I'll go until I go home to glory and it goes home to perdition. The idea behind what Billy Sunday said there is we've got to fight against sin as long as we live. Because sin will raise its ugly head time and time and time and time and time and time again in your Christian walk. In the moment that we lull back and say, nah, I'm just going to put this thing on cruise control. I'm doing good. I'm just kind of on this spiritual cakewalk. I've got my eternal card punched. I've got my fire insurance cashed in. I'm ready to go to glory. And the moment that we take that passive attitude, sin begins to creep back into our lives and temptations begin to creep back into our lives. And if we take on this attitude of being passive, we fall to those things. Sometimes dying to sin is like cutting down that really annoying tree or bush or shrub that you have in your yard. Because those things, when you go cut them down, they might stay gone for a long time, but eventually they sprout up. And if you don't do anything about them, they grow up bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger. And then you come in and you have this moment and you cut them off again. You've got to be diligent about it constantly. If you keep that thing trimmed up, if you take care of that yard, eventually that thing will be gone. But if we sit back and let it go, it'll spring back up. So first of all, we said, Paul opens up this chapter of Romans with this question, shall we go on sinning or shall we continue in sin? And we said that first of all, no, we shouldn't do that because one, we've died to sin. Second of all, no, because we live with Jesus, because we live with Christ. If you look beginning in verse 8, going through verse 10. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. We live with Christ. We are alive with Christ. And our union with Him is what makes all the difference in the world. You know, in my life, and I'm not that old, and I maybe haven't been around for that long, but in, in my life I've had these, these just kind of people that came into my life that were really my, my spiritual parents, my, these, these, this, these spiritual bedrock people in my life that I've had as examples of a couple of pastors that we had while we were in college come to mind. And then these people just, just poured into me, poured the Word of God into me. Uh, the, the last pastor we had before we left in college still, still texts me from time to time. He'll, he'll text me a prayer for our church, and he'll text me and ask how things are going. And he, he just pours into me, and I have these examples. And I had this, this great-grandmother, and I told you all about her before, but she lived the example in front of me. And she was the person that anybody on that side of the family, and even the other people who barely knew her, somebody got sick, you called Mom Maggard. Because you knew that Mom Maggard was going to fast, she was going to pray, she was going to lay prostrate on the floor of her apartment for 12 hours at a time, just moaning in the spirit if she had to, but she was going to make intercession for you. And what people began to see was that her prayers were answered. And what I, what I see with, with those pastors and, and with my great-grandmother, that those people lifted me higher. And that those people made me better than I, than I could have been by myself. 
And as I listened to them teach, and as I, I listened to them preach, and I listened to them pray, and I watched them live the Christian life, and I, was, I was raised up a, a little bit higher in my faith. And here's the thing. If those men, if those humans could help me, then man, what about Jesus? How much could He help us? The writer of the Hebrews. It says in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Because of who Jesus is, because of what Jesus did in His life, because of what Jesus did with His death, we are better than we could ever be in life. He's saved us. He's taught us with His teaching. He's taught us with His life. And He's come to live in and through us every day through the power of the Holy Spirit. So because... We live with Christ. Not only are we dead to sin, but we're alive in Christ. So we're dead to sin, but also because we're alive in Christ, we say no to sin. And we say that sin won't continue. So Paul asks this question. Shall we continue in sin? Shall we go on? Shall we keep on sinning after we have this new law? No, because we've died to sin. No, because we live with Jesus. And thirdly, no, because we are liberated. Look at verses 13 and 14. Do not offer parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law but under grace. We are liberated by grace, by His grace. There was a man who was filling out a job application. And he wanted to, to work at this bank. And he's sitting there in front of the manager at the bank. And he's filling out all these things. And he comes to the, the question that says, have you ever been arrested? And his answer said, no. And the next question said, why? And it was really just for people who had been arrested. But in that blank, the man wrote, never got caught. <laughs> but the thing is, tonight, we've all been caught in our sin. Because even if man didn't see us, God did. Amen. And consequently, caught in sin does not just mean you get into an earthly situation of turmoil with people around you because they found out what you did. Caught in sin means we get in trouble with God because God desires a life of holiness and purity. God wants us to be better people than we are on our own because He wants us to be like Himself and He is completely holy. In 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 16. He says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. And sometimes we read scriptures like that and we read things like, be holy in all that you do. And we think, man, that sounds like something of a tall order for me. Because I'm not holy in all that I do. I'm not holy in all that I say. But can I tell you tonight that I would like to be? I would like to be without fault. I would like to be without sin. But before we can ever come close to that point, we've got to be free from the power of sin. We've got to be set free and we've got to be liberated from the bondage of sin before we can ever really grow and become what God wants us to be. A while back, if you remember, there was this huge scandal with Bernie Madoff. Some of you may remember. And Bernie Madoff gets sentenced to go to prison for 150 years because of this, this Ponzi scheme financially where he ripped off and stole billions of dollars. In fact, about $65 billion dollars he stole from people who invested in his, in his companies. So if he sends to 150 years, Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> well, <laughs> Bernie Madoff. Bernie, I'm telling I teach 
history and politics, Bernie Madoff is never going to be liberated from that cell that he sits in in Butner, North Carolina. But the thing is, he's, he's in a prison cell now. He got put in prison when he was 75 years old. He's not going to serve that long. He's got a 150 year sentence. But here's the thing. Bernie, uh, Bernie Madoff was in prison long before he ever actually got sentenced to go to that prison Amen. in North Carolina. He was a prison to the desires of the flesh. He was a prisoner to greed. He was a prisoner to envy. And because he was so imprisoned by the sin and the flesh, it led him to commit this act that now he's in an actual prison. Some people are in prison and don't even realize it. Some people are in prison to those desires of the flesh. Some people are in prison to their sin, and they're not going to realize it, some of them, until they're in an actual prison. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Bible tells us, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Because in reality, we were all in bondage to sin. We were all in the prison of sin. And the only thing that could set us free from that was the sacrifice, was the blood of Jesus that we sang about tonight. Later on in Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, he says, But thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And I wonder tonight if that's true of us. Set free. Because Paul tells us that we have been, if we've trusted in Jesus, that we've been set free. That we've been set free from the penalty of sin and we've been set free from the power of sin. It's a big yes that Jesus gives us in this situation. We don't have to sin anymore because Jesus... We, we want to teach all day long that Jesus set us free from the penalty of sin. But man, not a lot of people want to teach that Jesus came to set us free from the power of sin. And Jesus came to empower us to be able to live that life of holiness. Not that we are never going to stumble or mess up, but Jesus came to liberate us from that as well so that we could live the life that He called us to live. Amen. He didn't say, be holy as I am holy and expect us to sin every day, word, thought, and deed. Oops. I'm just saying, we don't have to live that way. So even though we, even though we struggle with sin, even though there are issues and there are things that we that we struggle with, God has called us to live the holy life. And so Paul opened up this 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 sixth chapter of Romans with this question: If we're in Christ, shall we go on sinning, or, or shall we keep on sinning? And we know that we shouldn't. We know that when we're truly converted, we know that when we repent, that that means we turn from our sins, that we go a different direction. We know as we saw tonight that we shouldn't go on sinning because one, we've died to sin. Because two, we live with Jesus. And because three, we've been liberated from the power of sin. But I wonder tonight if that's true in our lives. Because too many times, I'm just going to call it what it is. Too many times we hear messages like this on a Wednesday night and we're at the church and we sit back and say, well, yeah, yeah, people need to turn from their sin. You know what we don't want to do? We don't want to turn that around and look inside ourselves and see if there's sin in us Amen. that we've gone on doing. Because we want to sit back and say, man, I come to church on Wednesday night. I don't cuss and I don't drink and I don't watch that bad stuff on TV. And I'm good. We need to go out there and find those people who we need to go find the sinners. Too many times when we do that, we, we, we move things from drive and we just kind of shift them into park and say, God, I've grown and I've grown and I've been purified. I'm good. When God still wants to take us into the refining fire. When God still wants to point out those impurities in our life and bring us into this moment of purification and skim those off the top. And then allow us to move on and go to this until something else comes up. And He wants to skim that off the top. And God wants us to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. But too many times we, we, we think of sin as the, the big nose in the Bible. Like, I don't kill anybody. I'm glad that you don't. But I'm going to say this, in a crowd of 30 people, some of us got sin that's going on. We might not like to hear that. We might think, who's he talking about? But in a crowd of this, some of us, some of us have sin. Now here's the thing. When we think about sin, we want to think about the same things all the time. I read an article today, and I kind of ripped it off here for the ending. But I read an article today about sins that the church has ignored, or sins that the church has become okay with. Let me run some of these by you. 
and see if maybe some of these strike us. Maybe we're not cussing and murdering and coveting or whatever it may be. Some of us may be. But let's see if any of these maybe strike us as. If Paul says we shouldn't go on sinning, are we doing these things? Number one, fear. Because as the Bible says 365 times, do not fear or do not be afraid. And we have fear or we're afraid. The Bible told me 365 times not to, and I do it. What is that? That's sin. Right. Here's another one. Apathy. Because can I tell you, there is nothing mediocre or normal about God. And when our Christian lives and everything about us says normal, average, just like everybody else, nothing stands out. That tells me we're not where we really ought to be with God. Because if people look at my life and they don't see really anything standing out, they don't see anything different from the world around me, things aren't where they ought to be. Gluttony. Now we hear the word gluttony and we think, man, I'm on a diet. Gluttony, gluttony really just means excess. I'm not saying like you go to the Golden Corral and y'all need to repent. But the word gluttony itself really means taking things in excess. Because we want to do everything in excess. We want food in excess. We want our phones and our social media in excess. We, 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 want, we want our TV shows and our Netflix in excess. And here's the thing. We want to gorge our stomachs with food and, and we, want to, we want to gorge our houses and our, and our driveways with the stuff that we think we need. Here's the thing, the more that we do that, the more that we give the next thing and the next thing and the next thing that we think is going to make us happy, the more we realize those things don't make us happy. And the thing about gluttony is it causes us to look for our happiness or look for our peace or look for our contentment in places other than in God. Amen. Here's another one. Worry. Because Jesus said we shouldn't worry about anything. And if Jesus told me I shouldn't do it and I do it, what is that? It's sin, and we don't like to say that, and we don't like to think that, and we don't like to hear that. But Jesus tells me that I shouldn't worry. Because here's the thing, worry is, is symptomatic of a bigger issue. Because if worry is a real issue or a problem for me, I have an issue with a lack of faith. One of my favorite quotes from Francis Chan, who you all know I love, he said this. It's a little bit long, but listen. He says, worry implies that we don't quite trust that God is big enough or powerful enough or loving enough to take care of what's happening in our lives. Stress says the things we are involved in are important enough to merit our impatience, our lack of grace toward others, or our tight grip of control. Basically, these two behaviors, worry and stress, communicate that it's okay to sin and not trust God because stuff in my life is somehow exceptional. Both worry and stress reek of arrogance. They declare our tendency to forget that we've been forgiven, that our lives are brief, and that in the context of God's strength, our problems are small indeed. A few more. Flattery. Now we live in a world where flattery is a problem. Because if my identity, if my happiness is tied to other people's approval of me, that's a problem. Because if my identity, if my happiness is tied to other people around me, guess what? People are fickle. People are fleshy. Uh, people are sinful. People are going to hurt me. People are going to disappoint me. I'm going to disappoint people. And if my happiness and contentment is based in the approval of other people, I'm going to be upset time and time again. But if my joy comes from the approval of Jesus, if my peace and my strength is found in my relationship with Him, then I'm a lot better off. Because let's be real honest, it's hard to point people to Jesus if you need their approval. Comfort. Because when the church becomes comfortable, Christianity starts to die. And I think too many times churches and individual Christians grow to a point of comfort. And man, things feel really good right here. So I'm, again, I'm just going to put it in park. This is comfortable for me. I don't want to step out and do that. I don't want to step out and talk to them. I don't really want to go there and do that. And we get into our comfort zone. Instead of doing what God has called us to do to advance the kingdom. Consumerism. Because many, I mean, a whole lot of Christians operate in, in the mentality of, of this idea of gimme, gimme, gimme. More, more, more. That we need more and more of the world's stuff and the, and the things of the world. And we become more concerned with the things of God, uh, the things of the world, than the things of God, than, than the spiritual riches that God wants to give us. 
And finally, I don't know why this is, but God just laid this on my heart and mind. Because I think that sometimes, even in some Christian circles, lying has become so socially acceptable that we often just let it go on undetected. We don't even notice it. We don't even think a thought about it when we lie or somebody else lies. And really, the thing is, we could, we could go on and on here. I mean, I'm not trying to like list every possible sin tonight. But the point is, I want us to think about the fact that sometimes there's sin that goes undetected in our lives. Sometimes there's sin that we've just kind of grown immune to and we've gotten comfortable with. And I don't want us to do that. In fact, before we pray tonight, I want us to think about the words of the Psalms. In Psalm 139, 23, and 24, when he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And that's my challenge for you tonight. I want you to, if you stay with me tonight, I want you to pray that as the prayer of your heart. Especially that line, see if there be any offensive way in me. Because we get this stigma in the church that, man, I've been saved and I've been sanctified and I've given it all to God and I've served God for so long. We don't want people to think that there might be an issue with sin in our lives. I want us to get past that tonight. I want us to pray this prayer. Search me, O oh God. Because if you'll pray that, if that will be the intent of your heart, in this moment, in this place, the Holy Spirit will search your heart. And if there are offensive ways in you, if there are things in your life, if there is unrepentant sin in your life, if there is something between you and God, if there's something in your life that tonight is the night for you to come to the refining fire and get rid of, God's going to reveal that to you. And the question is, are we going to do something about it? Paul opens up tonight with this question, shall we go on sinning or shall we continue sinning? So tonight I want you to pray that prayer. Search me, O oh God. See if there be any offensive way in me. And if He reveals something to you tonight, Paul told us three different reasons that we should not go on sinning. So if He reveals something to you tonight, would you come? Would you make it right? Would you lay it down at the altar tonight? Would you ask for forgiveness from it? Would you ask for the, the power and the option of the Holy Spirit to help you live in freedom, liberated from the bondage of that sin? Lord, see if there's any offensive way in us tonight. Father, would you reveal to us tonight, would you send the Holy Spirit, Father, to search every heart in this room that knows you? Father, and we pray tonight that you would reveal any offensive way in us. And Father, as the Holy Spirit searches our hearts in a crowd of this size, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal things, Father, that have come between us and you. Whether, whether Father, it's lust, or it's lying, or it's envy, or it's greed, or it's coveting. Or, Father, maybe it's something that we've gotten comfortable with and not thought about as a sin. Something like fear or worry. All of those things, Father, the Holy Spirit is revealing tonight. Would you encourage us? Would you empower us? Would you embolden us to come? Lay them at the altar tonight. Make things right with you. And to leave here tonight empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in freedom from the bondage of sin. Father, if you're speaking to hearts tonight, would you empower us to come and pray as we close out this service? If he's speaking to you, come and pray. Come while the waters are troubled. Come lay it at his feet tonight. We've been liberated from the power of sin. We just celebrate on Good Friday and Easter that Jesus died to give us this freedom. Embrace the freedom that he's given you and live in it right now. You don't rule me. It's a melody. You surround me with a song. I deliver it from my enemies to all my fears as a cold. Chosen me, Lord, have 
we leave this place is if you know Jesus as your Savior as you leave this place, that you leave here walking in the freedom that this bought for you. Amen. That you live walking in the freedom that the blood of Jesus was spilled to give you. Not just freedom from the penalty of sin, but freedom from the power of sin. Amen. That you walk in a life of holiness the way that He called you to. Not that we're not going to stumble. Not that we're going to live lives of perfection. But we are going to constantly seek that mark because that's what He set before us. Be you holy as I am holy. So my prayer tonight is that we leave here walking in freedom that He died to give us. Let's pray. Father, not we are thankful for Your Word. Thankful, Father, that the words that Paul wrote to us 2,000 years ago can challenge us. That can convict us because the Holy Spirit moves and works through them when we gather together and we break your bread of life. So, Father, as we leave this place tonight, Paul's told us that we shouldn't go on sinning. And your word has told us that, that, that the mark you have before us, that the, the call you have on our lives as believers is to live lives of holiness. And so, Father, as we leave this place tonight, those things that the Holy Spirit has challenged and quickened our hearts about, those things that we've laid at the foot of the cross tonight, Father, we ask that you would help us to keep them there, to not pick them back up, but to leave this place tonight, Father, and live lives where we walk in the power that you gave us to be free from sin, that we walk in the liberty that you've given us. We have been liberated from our bondage. So help us, Father, to live lives that show the world that we've been liberated. Would you go with us and bless us and keep us? As we leave this place tonight, we ask this all in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen.